Father Joe, this is Maddie. We're wondering where you are. Call back. Thank you. Sent Saturday, October 13th at 3.05 p.m. Father Joe, call me back, will you please? Sent Saturday, October 13th at 3.08 p.m. Joe, John King. Uh, I just got a call that uh, there's a call at the church there and the district guys are coming over there. Um, if you need anything, give me a call, will you? Bye. Sent Saturday, October 13th at 4.06 p.m. Joey, Dad, call me right away. <clears throat> Please, call me. Sent Saturday, October 13th at 4.51 p.m. Uncle Joey, it's me. You have to call me right away, okay? You have to call me because they said that there's something wrong with the church. You have to call me, okay? To make sure you're okay, so please, please call me right away, okay? Please call me today. Sent Saturday, October 13th. At 4.51 p.m. Joey, call me back. Okay. Sent Saturday, October 13th. At 5.40 p.m. Joey, I wish you would call me. I love you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. My name is Gavin. This is my channel. I'm glad that you would be here. Today, we're beginning to dig into a case that I've been working on for at least the past six months. I've gathered a lot of information on this case. I've gathered a lot of documentation on this case. And the case is of the death of Father Joe Marino who was a, a parish priest at St. Lawrence Roman Catholic Church in Buffalo, New York. Now, I came to know about this case because there is a connection to a case that is already very important to me, the case of Amanda Winkowski, who, uh, if you've followed the channel, you know all about her. There's, there's lots of videos on the channel about Amanda Winkowski. But Father Joe was Amanda Winkowski's family priest. And so I found out about this through Amanda's mom, Leslie. It is a tragic, tragic case that um, for many of the same reasons that the cases that I'm drawn to are tragic. Not only do we have a, a death here, that uh, that is an apparent homicide, but the system has fought against against that. In the case of Father Joe, the medical examiner ruled his death a suicide uh, by gunshot wound to the head. Um, this is the same medical examiner, by the way, that ruled Amanda Winkowski's death a an accidental overdose. Her name is Diane Vertis. So I just thought that I would, in this episode, kind of let you know a little bit about the case, introduce you to this case. But like Ellen Greenberg, Rochelle Brinson, Amanda Winkowski, this is a case that's going to take many, many videos to dive into because there are just so many things wrong that I don't want to... I don't want to miss anything. And as I've been going to, um, to get more documentation on this, in fact, I was up in Buffalo just this past weekend getting more documentation on this. I went to visit Father Joe's family. Uh, pictured on the left there is his twin sister, Sue Marino, his dad, uh, Joe Marino Sr., and his niece, Christina. 
Um, I went to visit and get some more documents from them. And uh, let me just show you this right here is the pile of documents that I do not have scanned yet. So uh, um, if you go to my website, which is gavinfish.com, uh, let me, let me show you this. You will find father Joe's case on my case page right here at the top. These are, these are in order of, uh, of date, uh, in a descending manner. So here's father Joe's case page right here. Uh, when you click on it, you are going to find just like on all of my case pages, um, an overview of the case, uh, photos, including all the crime scene photos that we have and many of the case documents. These are the case documents that I uh, had in my possession prior to going to Buffalo, New York this past weekend. So I will be busy organizing everything that I did scan um, and adding it to this page. So as we go through Father Joe's case, you'll be able to find those there. So a little bit about, uh, about Father Joe. Um, okay, so he was a 54-year-old uh, Catholic priest. Uh, he was one of two children. I just showed you a picture of his twin sister, Sue. Um, in fact, I've got, uh, let's see, I've got uh, a, some of these things. This, these are uh, photos of him and Sue uh, when they were born. But like all twins, uh, Father Joe and Sue were the closest of friends, shared uh, a bond that many of us who aren't twins don't really understand. And, uh, and he was a, uh, not only was he a, a local parish priest, but he was and and kind of a priest of the people, right? He was he was one of these uh, guys that really loved being in the trenches, so to speak. He loved his parishioners. He had been in the diocese of Buffalo uh, for many, many, many years. He had served in many different parishes over the years. He was very popular in the city of Buffalo, New York. Um, but not only that, he was also a chaplain for the Buffalo Police Department, for the fire department, and many police and fire departments actually throughout the country. He was decorated by President Bush for his service uh, in New York City uh, on 9-11 when, uh, when the Twin Towers were attacked. He, uh, he rushed to New York City. He was, one of, he was just one of these... Um, kind of humble, in the trenches, love the people kind of priests. And um, he was found in the intro, you, you heard the voice of a man who called himself Maddie. His name, uh, let me show you him, uh, is Matthew Charles, um, I don't know, I've forgotten how to pronounce his last name, Lush. And he, uh, Maddie and his wife, uh, well, his wife was at a uh, nursing home called St. Francis and Father Joe was scheduled to do a mass at St. Francis at 3 p.m. on October 13th, 2012. When he didn't show, uh, Maddie started calling and when he couldn't get a hold of Father Joe, he drove over to um, St. Lawrence to the rectory where Father Joe was. And he met up with a man named Deacon Paul Weisenberger. They, uh, they arrived at the same time. This is Deacon Paul and his wife, Mary. Um, they arrived pretty much at the same time. They went into the rectory. Maddie stayed on the first floor. Deacon Paul went up to the second floor. And uh, when he uh, went up to the second floor there, he found Father Joe. He described it as finding Father Joe asleep in his chair. But as he approached Father Joe, um, he found that he had been, he was dead. Uh, he was still a little warm to the touch, uh, but he had an apparent wound to his head. And uh, when According to Deacon Paul, when he kind of nudged Father Joe, he saw a um, 
he saw a handgun, which was uh, pictured in the intro to the video. It was a small 38 caliber snub-nosed gun. I'm going to do an entire video on that gun because it's got its own story. But so after Deacon Paul and Maddie find, well, Maddie didn't go up there, but after Deacon Paul finds Father Joe dead in his rectory, uh, he calls 911. And of course, Father Joe was a chaplain for all of the emergency responders in Buffalo. They rush over to the scene and they find that uh, Father Joe is dead. Now, what's interesting is that in the call to um, in the call to 911, Deacon Paul apparently said Father Joe has committed suicide. Now we've never Sue has never been able to get that 911 call. I tried getting the 911 call, but they don't retain them that long. Uh, the reason that I say that uh, Deacon Paul said that Father Joe killed himself is because in the documentation, uh, I'll have to find it here real quick, but in the documentation, uh, it states that uh, they were going on a suicide call. Um, Let's see, I can't, I can't find that right now, but I will, I will show that to you another time. So um, as you can see in the crime scene photos, uh, Father Joe uh, did look kind of relaxed. Um, let me get over to it again so you guys can see it. Uh, he was kind of sleeping in his chair. Um, let me get back to this photo. So it kind of looks like he's sleeping in his chair. His legs are crossed. Um, but there are problems with this scene. Uh, number one is a person who commits suicide typically does not relax before doing it. I've talked with uh, Detective Jennings, who has been on this program before. Suicides, typically they have their feet flat on the floor. Um, it just it just kind of looks staged. The other thing is his gun or the gun was found kind of between his leg. Let me, uh, let me zoom. kind of between his leg and the cushion here uh, or the side of the chair, the, the arm. And um, I have tried several times in a recliner to shoot myself, so to speak, and drop the gun and have it land there, it never does. So um, it feels like the gun was placed there. And then when you look at the rest of the office, there's actually a broken drawer here. And Sue has stated that uh, that she was in the rectory just a couple days before that drawer was not broken. So it was like somebody had tried to get in to that drawer. And then Stu, Sue also has stated that there are things missing. Uh, there was a um, file cabinet missing. His fax machine was missing. Um, you can actually see the gun bagged uh, right, right there. That is, that is the gun um, that apparently they found. So, um, so we've got a scene that looks staged. Let's just, let's just leave it at that for this episode. Okay. Uh, so the scene is staged, the drawer is broken. There's a missing filing cabinet. So what happens with father Joe is he is taken, um, after many hours of the police and everybody being at the scene, he's taken to the Erie County medical examiner's office and he is an autopsy is performed uh, two days later on the 15th, uh, by Erie County medical examiner, Diane Verdes. Now this is, uh, the report. Um, it's a four page report. Uh, you will notice when we get to the end of it, unlike the Amanda Winkowski case, it is signed by one medical examiner. But I want to read the opinion of Dr. Vertis here, who ruled uh, Father Joe's death as a suicide by gunshot wound, contact gunshot wound to the head. Let me zoom up in here. Um, 
The death of this 54-year-old male is attributed to a self-inflicted contact gunshot wound of the head. The gunshot wound injured the brain and skull with internal hemorrhage. A single fragmented bullet is recovered. No note of intent is found. So there was no suicide note. The deceased had not been consuming alcoholic beverages prior to his death. Now this is, to me, this is very important. Family members provided information regarding the decedent, including his past medical history. A workman's compensation report dated 31706 described a left hand injury. While this report documents inflicted injuries, no further reports are forthcoming at this time regarding more recent function malfunction of the hand. The same report documents the decedent's right hand dominance. The above information in itself does not rule out the possibility that the decedent used his left hand to injure himself. A scenario where the gun is held in the left hand and the right hand is used to pull the trigger is just one of many possibilities. And then Dr. Verdes stated, should further compelling information become available regarding the circumstances of this death, the manner of death may be revisited. So uh, according to Sue, let me show you more of Sue here. Uh, Father Joe's twin sister, um, according to Sue, um, Father Joe had had an injury to his left hand. Uh, and this injury occurred actually at the church when an assailant came in and tried apparently to rob Father Joe. And uh, in the struggle that Father Joe had with this assailant, his hand was slammed in a door three times. And then with a serrated knife, the assailant uh, attacked his hand and cut his hand. So Sue Marino explained this to Dr. Verdes and Dr. Verdes left open the possibility that look, if we can prove that he did not have use of his left hand, then I am willing to revisit that whether this is a suicide or not. So I just kind of want to go over it. Let me, uh, I've got a, I've got a toy gun in my, um, th this is a toy just so you guys know, I'm not a person, uh, who, um, would point a loaded gun at myself. This is, this is a, a toy with, with no charge, nothing. Okay. So the idea was that Father Joe, being right-hand dominant with his left hand, reached back and shot himself like this. Sue's, um, Sue, his sister, saying there's no way that he could have done that because his hand was so injured that he did not have the ability to grab a gun and, and point it like this at his head. He would have had to use his right hand at which point it's, it's really difficult to establish the trajectory if he were to have used his right hand. It's just, it's really impossible to, with your right hand, the way the gun was, make it shoot in the direction that, that it did. Now, um, after Dr. Verdes um, gave her opinion on this, um, she, uh, Sue employed Dr. Cyril Wecht to, uh, to take a look at the case and Dr. Wecht's report, which is on the website is a little more, um, in depth because, uh, Dr. Verdes never looked at father Joe's hand. She only looked at his head and, um, Dr. Wecht, he, he looked at the hand. So, uh, you can go to the website and you can, you can read this report, but I want to, um, I want to read, uh, his opinion right here. So Dr. Weck's opinion, uh, let me see for some reason. There we go. Okay. Dr. Weck's opinion is following my review of extensive material submitted by the sister of the deceased based upon the entrance of the gunshot wound and its trajectory, that trajectory, uh, went from, you know, 
down below the ear to kind of like this, right? It went through and up. Um, so uh, based on the trajectory, it is my opinion expressed with a reasonable degree of medical certainty that a right-handed individual trying to commit suicide is highly unlikely to shoot the weapon with his left hand in his left posterior temporal area. Moreover, as a result of a significant documented injury to his hand, which produced substantial muscular weakness and diminished mobility of that hand, it would have been extremely awkward for him to have committed this physical act. So that is the opinion that Dr. Wecht provided to Sue Marino. Now, when I was up in Buffalo uh, earlier, you know, this past weekend, um, I, um, I, I had the chance to take a look at some of this documentation. So I want to, I want to show it to you. Let's see. Um, I'm just going to show you some of it, um, because I haven't had the chance to really organize this. Um, the, the medical binder that Sue had <laughs> was so thick and had so much stuff, but, um, there is a uh, documentation that uh, Sue was able to get about father Joe's hand, including, you know, this crushing injury. These are different, uh, you know, um, times that he went and visited the hospital, uh, in extreme pain. This is a photo of his hand. Um, dang it. Let me see. Let me try to, there we go. Uh, that he took after his injury. Um, and then there's even, uh, some, uh, you know, he, he had been given medication for this. He had said that, um, think, yeah, uh, he, he was prescribed Percocet I mean, uh, and he described in some of this documentation that the pain that he was feeling in his left hand was, um, was a 10 out of 10 on the pain scale. He just had a real hard time with that hand. Now I don't have the photos. I wasn't able to scan them and I will in a later video, but there's also photographic evidence that prior to his injury, his hand in photographs would be extended and used all the time. But after the injury, his hand was always in a fist. He really had no ability to use that hand. So the idea that with a fisted hand, he would be able to kill himself just isn't, isn't really within the realm of a reasonable, reasonable possibility to me. So, so I guess now that I have established at least to my satisfaction that I really just don't think that father Joe did commit suicide or could have committed suicide. If there's homicide, then there has to be, I guess, motive for that homicide, right? Now, um, what I have found is that Father Joe was actually a whistleblower priest. There was a huge amount of uh, abuse of children, sexual abuse of children happening in the Buffalo diocese. And Father Joe was a whistleblower. He had been working with victims of this abuse for so long in his career, he had actually seen evidence uh, himself of sexual abuse within the, within the diocese that he had an appointment with um, an archbishop who is known as the apostolic nuncio. And this is a person who is sent by Rome to investigate problems within the church. And uh, Father Joe had an appointment with the nuncio uh, on the 15th, two days after he died. That was number one. Now, I have documentation for some of this. Um, there is uh, this statement um, that this document is actually pretty long and I want to go through it a little bit and it's dated. There are different dates to this. This one was from 2002. This one is from 2012, um, which is just a few months before he died. So let me just, let me just read, uh, this one. So, uh, again, June 20th, 2002, father Joe states, um, 
We had our annual birthday party anniversary and St. Patrick's party for my former pastor, Monsignor James G. Kelly. The regular clergy came to the party and we had pizza wings and the bar was fully loaded for anyone's request. In the course of the evening, Monsignor Kelly was having a good time and several drinks as well. Trust me, no one was feeling any pain that night. Um, let me zoom in on this so you guys can see it better. Uh, sorry, my mouse kind of goes crazy. Um, when the guests started to leave, it was just myself and Kelly started to clean up his residence. He was making a lot of jokes while drinking and he was lit from the alcohol. As I was carrying the pizza boxes from his room, he went into the bathroom. He stumbled a bit going in and coming out. As he came out, his zipper was wide open and his penis was exposed and enlarged. He came toward me and said, make your pastor happy and rub it. With that, I put the pizza boxes down and I directed Kelly to his bed. I told him to sleep it off, that he was drunk. I told him that I would take both masses the next day so he could sleep in. I took his car keys away, shut the TV off, put his cats into his study, closed the door to his residence, went back to my room at the rectory and locked all my doors. The next morning, nothing was ever said about what he did by him nor myself. I'm not even sure if he recalled what he did. Thus, he was so intoxicated. So Father Joe wrote that in 2002. Now, this one is written to Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, who is the Apostolic Nuncio at the time. He wrote this. I am writing this letter on behalf of a growing number of parents and parishioners from Blessed John Paul II Church in Lakeview, New York, Diocese of Buffalo. The pastor, Father Peter J. Carolus, continues to seek out young boys and teenagers from the parish. We have spoken to him about his relationship with the boys, and he continues to ignore our concerns. Father's disposition is very feminine and weak. His feminine nature only causes more worries and concerns for the parents that he is gay and trying to entice younger boys and teenagers into relationships with him. I have written to the bishop in the past, but Father has friends in the chancery, and we are certain that all of our letters are being kept from the old bishop and most likely our new bishop as well. Father Carolus is very close friends with Monsignor David Lipuma, secretary to the bishop. Archbishop, as we parents are praying and hoping your office will begin an investigation into Father Carolus and stop him from trying to force himself onto younger boys and teenagers. So Father Joe wrote this on behalf of the parents and he sent it to the nuncio and to several people, including uh, Bishop Malone, who was the uh, Bishop of the Diocese of Buffalo. And uh, he mentions a man named uh, Monsignor David Lapuma. Now David Lapuma actually showed up to the rectory uh, at about 4 p.m. after Father Joe was killed. So uh, the, believe me, there are way more of these. This is just an example that I want to show you. Father Joe had collected a long bit or a long collection of documentation about um about sexual abuse of children and teenagers within the Buffalo diocese. And he was going to the apostolic nuncio two days after he died to, um, to, to talk about that to the nuncio. So to me, that is, that is motive for a possible murder. Now the, the other thing that has motive for the possible mo murder, and I have documentation on this that I will put on the website. Um, Father Joe noticed that there were missing funds in the parish. Now he did not have a signatory power out of that account. He could not write checks from the parish. That was the responsibility of Deacon Paul Weisenberger and his wife, Mary. Um, let me, uh, that these guys right here, right? Deacon Paul and Mary, they were, they had signing authority from the parish there at St. Lawrence. Lawrence, uh, Father Joe did not, but he, Father Joe was suspicious that there were, there were funds missing from the account. And so he called in an audit. And when the audit came in, they found that there was $500,000 missing from that tiny little parish. So, um, and then at the same time, Father Joe 
who um, who kept checks in his uh, unlocked in checkbooks unlocked in his uh, in his office in his rectory started to notice that there were funds that started to be missing from his personal account as well. So um, I just want to show you a couple of these. Um, these are forged checks um, that were written out of Father Joe's account that do not have his signature on them. Um, these are all forged and they're done some hundreds of dollars at a time. Uh, I have a long, a, a big collection of handwriting samples and I'm no expert on handwriting, but I have a long collection of it. And, uh, to me, it's obvious that this, these are forged checks. So the motive for father Joe's death, in my opinion, could have been either that he was going to be a whistleblower about the, um, sexual abuse that was happening within the Buffalo diocese and that there was, uh, there was fraud, there was embezzlement going on in his parish. And he suspected that it was happening throughout the diocese as well. So I guess that is the introduction to the case of father Joe Marino. Um, I believe that this is going to be I mean, there are so many documents, you guys, there are so many documents that I haven't even come close to touching. Um, this is the pile that I need to go back up to Buffalo to, um, to scan. And I had scanned, I spent hours with Sue scanning and scanning and scanning, and I just didn't even make a dent. So, um, as I organize these, I will put them up on the website so you guys can check them out. I'll also give you updates on the case. Now, uh, on my way out, uh, I know this, we're already 32 minutes into this. I just wanted to thank you guys, all of you who were concerned about me that I had kind of given up on YouTube or something was wrong. Um, there was nothing wrong. There's just so much going on in the cases that I'm looking at. Not only do I have thousands and thousands of pages of documents on Father Joe's case, but we have almost 2000 pages of documents on, um, on Ellen Greenberg's case. And I am in touch with the investigator on that case, the private investigator on that case and a member of Ellen's family. So I'm getting even more information out of them, which will be coming out in an upcoming video. Uh, more is happening with the Amanda Winkowski case. So I've just got so much going on. Um, I think the pace at which I publish videos will likely slow down a little bit, but uh, this week I'm going to be doing on Friday uh, a live stream. We're going to do an Ask Me Anything on the cases that I'm covering, including some of the other cases that I'm really not doing deep dives into, like um, what's been happening uh, with the Helena Hutchins and Joel Souza case and what's been happening with uh, Brian Laundry, Gabby Petito. Uh, so Ask Me Anything. We'll be doing that on Friday. I'll be scheduling that up and I hope you guys join me for that. I also want to take a moment to especially thank, uh, my patron supporters, my Patreon supporters, my trade patrons make it completely possible for me to do this. I want to thank you guys for, uh, for all of your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I will bid you adieu and I hope to see you next time. Take care. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to my channel. And if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below.